Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be doing a couple things. First off, we're going to be doing some debug extensions. We're going to use this to draw spheres into the world to use for debugging in-game later on. Then the second part is going to be actually creating the spheres and placing them where we want the hands to be. This is going to be an objective. This is not going to be the actual location of the hands, as we're going to use some Bezier curves to actually move the hands through the world, and then of course some physics to pull it all together. So we're going to get all of that, but it's going to be a little bit later in the tutorial. The timestamps are on screen if you want to jump to that. So the debugging is going to be pretty simple. We're going to create a static class into the helpers folder, and we're going to call this debug extensions. And this is just going to be used for anything having to do with debugging like this. Now we'll go ahead and open that up and let's change a couple things. Let's first off make it static. We're not going to inherit from node and we're going to delete all of this. Now, next up, we're going to create a couple functions. The first one is going to be the draw point function, and we're doing something a little bit different with this. So here we use the this keyword. This is going to make it so that in any node, we can go ahead and reference this function. So because it's static, it's not actually housed within the world. It's just accessible from anywhere. There is something important with static functions is you can't store data or else other functions that are using the same static function will be able to see that same data. It's not unique to each node. Now, within this, there's a couple things things I want to step through. When I say this node, basically what this means is that we can pull this from any node inherited object. So if we go over to a navigation object, we can actually go ahead and call this if we say this dot draw point. And you can see we already have that functionality there. This just lets us use this anywhere. We're also going to need to cache this node because we are actually going to use this later on to insert into the scene the object that we're drawing. Let's flesh this out a little bit. So first off, we're gonna need a couple variables. The first one is going to be a mesh instance 3D. This is going to be used to actually draw the object into the world. The next one is going to be a sphere mesh, and this is going to be used to tell this mesh instance what it actually needs to draw. And then of course, a material, which is just going to be a standard material 3D. Could use a custom shader here, but for now, this will work just fine. So first off, let's go ahead and set the mesh instance dot mesh to the sphere mesh. And let's go ahead and set the shadow casting to false and the position of it is going to be the target position up here in the vector three up here. And the position vector is going to be the position up here. It's just a global space vector. So next up, let's go ahead and modify that sphere mesh. Let's set its radius to the size divided by two and the sphere mesh dot height equals its size. This is an important one. If you don't check its height, for some reason, it ends up becoming an ellipsoid. For now, this is all we need to do to make it perfectly spherical, and it just looks better that way. So let's go ahead and set the material equal to our new material. And we're going to change a few things about the material. Let's set the shading mode first off to unshaded. This is gonna make it look very debuggy so that that way we don't mistake it for something that's actually supposed to be in the final game later on. And then we're gonna set the albedo color to whatever the color is that we've passed in. And then last up, we're gonna go ahead and get the origin node, which is the node that we're calling this from. We're going to use the get tree function and we're going to use the root of that tree and just add the child mesh instance. This is going to go ahead and put it into the world. Now, if the duration is not zero, then we do want it to actually delete it. If it's zero, we're just gonna assume it lasts forever. So if it's not zero, we're just gonna go ahead and create a new timer. This is going to be of type scene tree timer. We're gonna use the same get tree function. We're just going to call the create timer with the duration in it. And let's go ahead and tie into that timer's timeout signal and we'll create a new callable, which We'll select the mesh instance and call the function Q free. Now, besides the draw point, I do want to go ahead and make a draw debug line. This is going to be the same basic principle, but a slight difference. In order to actually draw a line, we're going to use a primitive type of lines, and we're going to use a immediate mesh object as opposed to a sphere mesh. So this is a little bit different. I'm not going to go into too much details. It just adds a couple vertices, and then it does pretty much the exact same thing. So let's go ahead and save that and see how it looks in game. So if we go ahead and go over to the basic enemy navigation agent, we can add a couple lines for debugging. First off, let's go ahead and draw a point above the AI. This will be just the global position plus two on the Y axis. And let's go ahead and make the size of it a little bit larger. Let's put the size as 0.5. So this is just gonna draw a red sphere above the AI. And then we're also gonna do the same thing, but build debug line with a position starting at the position of the AI and ending at the player's position. And this is also going to just be red. So let's go ahead and save that and let's see what they look like in game. And as you can see, we now have some debug lines and a debug sphere. And it just fell off the world. That's just fine. All right, so now we can go ahead and move on to the actual hand placement code. So this is gonna be requiring a little bit of modification to the scene prefab for the enemy. So let's go ahead and throw in a couple nodes here. First off, we're gonna create a normal node type. We're gonna call this limb placement controller. 
And let's go ahead and create another child node, which is going to be of Raycast 3D. And we're just going to call this one Limb Placement Raycast. Now we're going to leave all this default. Because we're excluding the parent, it's not going to bother with the parent, which is on layer one. But the world is currently layer one as well. Later on, we'll probably swap the AI over to another layer so we don't confuse them. But for now, it works just fine. And the target position doesn't really matter because we're going to override that in the code. So let's go ahead and create that code. If we go up here to Limb Placement Controller, let's create a new script in the enemies folder. We're going to call that limb placement controller. Now we are going to need a couple variables. We're not going to need the process function, though we are going to need the ready function. Let's go ahead and add in a couple references to the enemy body and the raycast. So the enemy body is just going to be the parent of the limb placement controller, and that's going to be of type rigid body 3D. And then the limb raycast is just going to be a raycast 3D. Now we do need a couple float variables. The first one is going to be the body length, and this is going to be divided in half and added to the front or back when using the raycast. And this is going to be the ideal complete length between the front front and back limbs positions, so the hands and legs positions. Then the body width, and this is just going to be the maximum width that we're spread apart on the hands and legs. This is going to be, give it a little bit of a spirey appearance. Next up, we're also going to need the target offset down. This is how far down the maximum extension of the limbs are. Now, besides that, we are going to go ahead and create an enum. Now, for anyone who doesn't know what an enum is, it is just basically a number, like an integer, with a name associated with that number. So in this case, left hand would be zero, right hand would be one, so on and so forth. And we're going to go ahead and put in the hands and legs into this. We're going to use this later for determining where in the world the hands should be, or the legs. Next up, and lastly, on the variable side, we're going to go ahead and create a reference to the last velocity. We're going to default this to vector3.forward. It really doesn't matter what it defaults to, but for the time being, this helps us with any sort of offset positions. So before we do anything, let's go ahead and set the limb raycast target position equals to a new vector three with forward vector being the negative of target offset down. This is going to get us the raycast pointed in whatever direction its look at vector is will be the maximum distance that the arm can reach. Next up, let's go ahead and override the physics process. It's important to do all this in the physics process because we're functioning with a raycast. If we don't do it in the physics process, it sometimes just won't work and sometimes will, so it's very inconsistent. Now, within the physics function, we are going to go ahead and create a for each loop. And the for each loop is doing something a little bit weird. We are using the enum.getValues function with a type of limb reference to basically loop through all of these different options. Now, the reason why we're doing this is actually just for debugging. Later on, we won't need this as we'll be actually repositioning the hands on a hand by hand basis or limb by limb basis. But for the time being, we just want to draw a red or green sphere at each of the different possible locations with red being if it's not hitting anything and green being if the raycast is hit. Something. So let's go ahead and create a new variable called target position. And we're going to be calling a function here that doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and create that function. So that function is going to be doing a couple things. First off, it's returning a vector three, which is whatever the actual end result location is. It's going to be taking a limb reference. So that's going to tell it what the offset should be. If it's upper right hand, then it needs to be out and to the front right something like that. And then the out Boolean is just going to return a Boolean saying whether it has impacted something or not. And we'll get to that in a second, but here in the actual physics process, we can go ahead and draw that point. So we're just going to call the debug function draw point with the target position. And for the time, we're just going to use the float delta. This is just going to make sure that it only exists until the next physics process. Then we're going to use a coalescence function with that Boolean that we're spitting out from the get target limb position function. And we're going to say, if we have impacted a surface, use the color green. If we haven't, use the color red. Remember, colors are RGB values. So one in the first variable is a red color. And then we're also going to set the size to just 0.3 meters. This just is a big enough sphere to be noticeable without being obstructive to everything else. Now let's hop down into get target limb position. And first off, let's go ahead and create a variable that's going to be the target position. This is going to be the variable that we return. So let's go ahead and call the return on that. And then in between those two, we're actually going to be modifying. So first off, let's check to see if the enemy body dot linear velocity dot length is greater than 0.5. This way, if the AI is just subtly moving or just wiggling around or walking sideways very slowly or something like that, we don't want it to actually rotate its entire body. It should side stripe or what have you. So let's go ahead and set that to length is greater than 0.5 and all we're going to do is say last velocity 
equals the current velocity dot normalize. This is just going to guess the direction we're currently moving. All right, so first off, we're going to go ahead and set the target position. We're going to add to it the current velocity multiplied by half of the body length, and then we're going to multiply that before we add it to the target position by either negative one or one, and that's going to be determined based off of whether the target limb is the feet or the hands. So basically, if target limb equals left foot or right foot, we're going to multiply it by negative one. That's going to get behind us in the velocity direction. Now let's go ahead and set the limb raycast position to that position. This is going to make sure that the raycast is raycasting from exactly where the hips should be or exactly where the shoulders are, should be, but not offset yet. So we're not actually going to offset it. That way we get an angle outwards. Otherwise the hands will never actually reach up and press on the ground because the raycast will always be straight down. And we do want him to like touch the walls and things like that as he moves around. So let's go ahead and add to that target position because now we have the raycast in the right location. Let's go ahead and use the cross function. And that's just going to use the left hand rule, which is a basic rule in mathematics that allows us to get the perpendicular vector to a target vector. So long as we have an up vector, which we're just going to assume is vector three dot up for right now. May have to change that later, but for now it'll work just fine. So the left hand rule will point a vector out to the left. So we multiply that by the body width divided by two. And then we check to see if it is if the limb is either left hand or left foot. And if so, we multiply that vector by negative one. And if not, we just multiply it by one, which just leaves it as is. So this is going to invert the limb if we're trying to get the other side. Now, next up, let's go ahead and use the target position dot Y. And we're going to subtract from it the target offset down. This is just going to put our vector down where we're supposed to be. Later on, we'll probably have to modify this to make it able to walk on walls and run on the ceiling but for the time being this will work just fine so let's go ahead and rotate that limb dot raycast to be looking at the target position now we do have to do a little bit of math here we have to get the absolute value of a vector pointing from the global position towards the target position so to do that you subtract the target position from the global position and we take the y of that and say if the absolute value of it is greater than 0.99 f this just makes sure that if we're pointed straight up or straight down that we go ahead and resolve that proper otherwise you get all those errors like we did in the previous tutorials. So finally, after that, we need to go ahead and force Raycast update. Otherwise, it may not actually update for the position that it's currently in and we'll get invalid data. So let's go ahead and update that. And then we're going to set the hit surface equals limb raycast is collide. Now you'll notice that the errors kind of went away because hit surface has to be assigned a value before the return function. So now that's done, we can go ahead and check the last if statement. If we have hit a surface, then let's go ahead and set the target position equals the collision point. And that should be pretty much everything we need to do. So if we go ahead and hit build, we'll hop into Godot and we can go ahead and assign these variables. So let's set the enemy body to the rigid body 3D. Let's set the raycast equals the limb placement raycast. Now all these variables are pretty much the way I want them to be, but I will be having to change them probably based off of whatever the mesh I make, though I'm probably going to ensure that the arms and legs of the mesh are very long just to help with this to make it look right. So let's go ahead and hit play and see how it looks. So as you can see, it kind of looks like a rover or something with the little green dots. And you can notice the green dots now move across the surface. And if they are not in contact with the surface, they turn red. And that's exactly what we want. So if we shoot the sphere, you can see they all turn red when they bounce off the ground. And they're pointed in whatever the vector of the character is. So if it's going upwards, the dots will be angled upwards. And that's going to be it for this week. So next week, we're going to be going over actually placing the hands in the correct locations with some Bezier curves to make them smoothly arc from one location to another. So thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful week and we'll see you all back here next week for the next tutorial.